why do I do this job? Why do I get up every day? Why do I want to do all the things that I do? The hardest part of county was, I mean, there's a, there, I don't even know where to start. <clears throat> I think by Friday, my body was broke every week. And then the final testing was brutal. I think they said it's the uh, most beautiful thing you go through, but you don't want to go through it again. Everything that this job entails is what I believe in Sasawa's job. I love protecting, I love serving, and helping people. I don't want to do anything else, and I don't see myself doing anything else. We uh, lost our home in the Witch Creek Fire in 2007. And that was kind of a big moment for me and my family. But we lost um, just about everything. Being able to become a firefighter, not only is it a great job, but I'm helping people in the way that I want to be helped. But when I finally have kids, I can be that father figure that I always wish I had. Well, there's been lots of failure leading up to this point, and uh, it's you find out a lot about yourself, you know, it's not everything is easy. It's a, it's a dangerous, you know, profession. It's, that stuff, you know, worries me. I don't want to, you know, retire and watch my kids grow up. Get paid to do what we do, run into burning buildings to save people, to help out when people are having their worst days. I mean, that's awesome. There's too many people still at the grocery stores that should be home. And I tried to figure out a way to make sure they stay home. I realized a lot of my friends that I play beach volleyball with are younger, healthy. They're not as threatened by this virus and they don't have anything to do. They're not even working. Nobody's working right now. So uh, I, I sent a text message to a group of about 500 of them and said, hey, if, if I put together, if I got the money, could you help me deliver groceries to elderly people so they don't have to leave their homes? And they responded, my phone blew up. In a half hour, I had 40 that were like, whatever, I'll drive, I'm all in. And within, uh, within 24 hours, we were making our first delivery. Uh, we set up a web page, we set up a GoFundMe site. This is not meant to last long, it's just meant to fill an immediate need until we figure out how we're gonna deal with this thing over the next few months. The hardest thing for me to manage right now is uh, controlling all the people that are trying to help. <laughs> the volunteers are coming in more than we can handle. We tell our drivers, don't even, interact with them. Just ring the doorbell and leave. They wear gloves and masks and they sanitize as much as they can. And I know it's much safer for these elderly people to have an encounter with one person who cares about their well-being rather than 150 people at Trader Joe's who are competing with them and don't. Every time an elderly person is indoors and doesn't expose themselves to all this, we're taking away the risk from them. And we owe, we owe it to them. We do everything we can to make sure a, at least one more person doesn't leave their home. I mean, even if we do catch this, we will be fine. If they do, they won't. It's, it's simple, it's simple. If you need more drivers, I will get them. We've served enough people to know that we've saved at least one life. And if we've done all this, all of this, and it ends up saving one person's life, it's worth it tenfold. Most of them call into the hotline because they don't know technology enough. I've heard, I've heard them say so many, I don't have a computer, is that okay? Y yes, we have a phone number. They call in. We have Joshua answer the phone most of the time. He's so charismatic, he connects with them well. Uh, he never runs out of energy for them. They, uh, we've had so many of them say, it's so nice to talk to somebody. There's something else going on more than them just getting some food. Somebody is caring for them and making sure, and then somebody's also talking to them a little bit, uh, it, or sometimes a lot. <laughs> uh, Josh has had some phone calls go on for a while, and, and we sometimes gather around and listen in. 
uh, because it's, I don't know, we've, it makes us realize there's more going on than us just getting some free food to some people. Okay, Hudson, thank you for reaching out again, and you should be in touch with her shortly. My name is Joshua, anything else, let me know. Thank you very much. My role is simple, kind of explain everything to anybody calling in. Um, I pretty much answer the phone morning, noon, and night, uh, describe what we're doing, because people can't believe it's free, uh, and say, hey, we use our own money, we get donations, we actually shop for you. It's for elderly people who can't get themselves out of the house and shouldn't. Um, and what I do is kind of just touch base with them and say, hey, what do you need on the list? And what extra things that you maybe need that is not on the list also? And then they tell me, oh yeah, I'm 75 and I have a lung condition or I just got diagnosed with cancer or I can't leave. And so our shoppers will go out and actually shop for them and drop it off and say, here it is. And then they'll say, hey, can I donate that amount to our foundation, whatever it is? Like, sure, no problem. And we use those funds for the next quarter. So right now it's over $6,000, it's pretty crazy, in three days. Someone get this guy a medal. Good job. We had a, a customer call in who had just got her husband out of the hospital. I believe he was 92 years old. She just was crying on the phone and said, I can't get a delivery uh, until Monday. We're out of food. And Ralph's won't deliver, Vaughn's won't deliver. No one's taking my calls. I can't leave. And I said, okay. And I had uh, Kenny actually go out and handpick her exact items and deliver to her within 30 minutes. It was just it was just awesome to hear that nobody could help her and we could. So without the foundation, without us doing Stay at Home San Diego, um, she would still probably be without food or have to go out herself and put herself at risk and get coronavirus. So that's something that really, a lot of people on the phone, it just kind of stopped. The whole room went quiet when I was on the phone on speaker and you can see tears in her eyes. You're like, wow, that's, that's what we're doing this for. And we are here today to announce that we are going to bring forward a new ordinance next month that will once again make it illegal to live in your car in San Diego neighborhoods. My office and several of the city council offices have received hundreds of emails and calls complaining about trash, about drug use, public urination, and more as a result of individuals that have been taking advantage of our city and acting inappropriately. This is not safe. This is not healthy. And this is not acceptable. If you are living out of your vehicle because you have nowhere else to go, there is and will be help for you. This isn't me needing help or being low on funds. This is me choosing this life and kind of having the freedom to go wherever I please, to save money, and to live the life that I want to live. Like, this should be my choice. <laughs> Two things, they don't add value to my life. What truly adds value to my life is helping other people. Um, and I'm doing that. I'm not homeless. I'm living a normal life, but I'm also out here to help people. I have everything I need. Like, it's not, I'm not struggling. I'm, I'm working. I'm doing everything everyone else does. I'm just living in a different like home and it's okay. <laughs> We're very concerned about people and families who are faced with the challenging circumstance of living in their vehicles. We want to help these people. On the other hand, you have the van lifers who are taking advantage of the recent repeal and camping overnight around our beaches. Many are leaving trash behind on our sidewalks and in our yards. This is creating a very unsanitary situation. The issues being brought up about like making messes and disrespect in the community. Um, I don't think it's fair to like generalize everyone or criminalize us when it's when we're the ones that are totally against that too and it's not everyone. Like any group of people, there's gonna be people that ruin it, but there's a lot of us that are out here just to have that freedom and we're just living and we do respect our community for sure. Ride your bike no matter what. There's no limits on somebody riding a bike. You could ride almost anywhere. I, however, opposite side of that, I can't leave my car just anywhere. Disabled people who drive, we have to have somewhere reasonable, reasonable to park. It's it's as simple as that. So you're interrupting life 
for everyone for a very small few. These new adjacent ADA spaces are a very long way away from 30th, um, a block away. That makes no sense. I can't walk that far. I understand the need to go uh, eco-friendly, to environmentally friendly, uh, to make it safe for, for riders and all that, uh, but we can't overlook accessibility and, and the convenience of actually being able to use your car as well. Generally, I support a new policy that's going to be progressive, that's going to uh, make it easier for people to get around, that's environmentally friendly. Uh, what I'm concerned about is removing or making it more difficult for other people. We have to be inclusive. We have to think about universal design and think about everybody's needs. People have fought for, for accessibility. People have fought for ADA. So it's really important that we keep what we have. You know, these spaces are being put into place and that's fine. We need stuff like this, right? To keep the scooters out of the sidewalks and to not be a hazard for people. But then you look around and there's no ADA spots. It's hard to make it accessible for everybody, but we have to try our best as, as a city, as a community, to provide accessibility for everybody. And I don't think the plan uh, does that 100%. Mambo Design is a nonprofit organization serving families, veterans, and individuals leaving homelessness. We take their empty houses and turn them into professionally designed, personalized spaces. What usually takes people days, weeks, sometimes months to do in our own homes, we do in a day. This home was completely empty this morning. There was no furniture. And now there's furniture and there's personal items and there's art and there's photographs and color. So the family is a very special family. Um, as a mother and her four children, ranging from ages 11 to 19. They left a domestic violence situation in 2014. At the end of the day, um, it's just a beautiful safe haven for the family to start the next chapter of their lives. What about if you dream a little bit more? We know as we leave that the family that we have just served is gonna look at this day as the day that their lives changed for good. Instantly, as soon as you see their faces and to see, to be there, to be blessed enough, lucky enough to be there in person and see their reaction is priceless. And I feel like everyone should be a part of an experience like that. Welcome home. Oh, wow. I just feel really fortunate. I mean, it's very emotional. Oh, oh my God. This is crazy. Nice. Oh my God. This is nice. I like you so much. I don't know where it's like just so shocked. <laughs> It's amazing to see our apartment go from nothing to everything you guys did now. Yeah. <laughs> 2017 was the last time we actually had a couch. It's crazy. We went through like a whole roller coaster from like having nothing and suddenly having a furnished place. And it's, I, it's, I'm really, really grateful. Seeing my room, I mean, I've never had a room look like that ever. <laughs> Everything that's here was hand-selected for the family of five that lives here based upon their color choices and their interests and their education. You know, you start thinking about that family, that person that's gonna be in that room and you wanna make it as homey as you can. Not knowing much about us, they came in and they did what they did. As far as the humble magic, yes. Because <laughs> everything you guys did here, it was magic. Does this feel like home? Oh, it does. So oh, good. We want this to be where you guys can lay there and dream of it now. And you deserve those things next to you. It doesn't mean that you have to have these material items, mm -hmm. but you deserve it. All the work that they did, it's really amazing. That was just absolutely brutal to watch where she would be just screaming in pain and then 
the lights went out and there were several times where I was, I basically thought I just watched my daughter die. I thought she died right in front of me, but then I looked at the vitals and her, you know, heart rate, oxygen saturation, all of that stuff was fine. And that's when I realized she just passed out because it's, she's in that much pain. Six-year-old Layla Mahoney is one of 60 kids in San Diego participating in a clinical trial for the Moderna coronavirus vaccine. On July 27th, I got an email uh, for the pediatric Moderna trial for ages 6 to 11. Around that time, that's when this whole thing with her brain cancer was, was, was really starting to ramp up, but we had absolutely no idea about it. For Layla, getting into the vaccine trial was very important because she starts chemotherapy this winter. I think, you know, losing her hair and seeing her physical appearance change drastically, I think that's going to be, um, that's going to be tough, for sure. A cancerous brain tumor sent the family rushing to Rady Children's Hospital for emergency surgery over summer break. One of the ER doctors had walked in on her screaming in pain, um, saying, um, you know, Daddy, save me, uh, do something. And um, I couldn't, I couldn't do a thing. And it was just like this absolutely positively helpless feeling. Um, and that ER doctor, she pulled me outside and she said, this is serious. The first surgery was uh, August 2nd. The second surgery was uh, September 8th. Though her pain is gone, Layla's parents worry that she could still end up getting COVID-19. But she almost didn't make it into the trial due to her cancer diagnosis. When we went in there, they said, is there any confirmed cancer diagnosis? And, that, and I said, no. I said, because we didn't know we didn't have one and we weren't going to have, have one for a couple of weeks. So she was allowed to proceed. I was really, really happy with that after getting the first shot. Ten minutes in uh, to the car ride home, St. Jude calls. We have a diagnosis. And I just laughed. And I was just, you know, and I, I said, what is it? And they said, it is cancerous. It is malignant. And it's, a, it's an ependymoma. Uh, she asked me, she said, are you OK? And I said, let me tell you what just happened. And she was just like, that is amazing. Like, that is so amazing that if I call. And she was supposed to call me an hour earlier, but something derailed her and so on. And so, I mean, it's just, uh, it, was, it was just, it was made to be. The Mahoney's vaccine decision is one that many more families will soon have to make. Pfizer company submitted its coronavirus vaccine for approval in kids just this week. We're hopeful and she's doing great. Uh, the doctors are just amazed and you wouldn't know that she's ever had a vaccine or ever had two brain surgeries or ever have cancer, you know, running through her head. You'd never know. And so for that, we're thankful. One of the simple decisions I made was I took our kitchen trash can, which is always what had the most trash, and I moved it to the other side of the house. And it turned out that little act turned out to be really smart because it basically made trash inconvenient. <laughs> and it made us kind of think every time we were about to throw something away, it gave us an opportunity to kind of say, well, what is this? Why did we bring this into our life? And is there any way that we could buy something different? We were forced to look at our trash, which most people don't have to do and figure out like, okay, so this comes in package. Can we buy this without a package? Okay, if we can't, then well, we're gonna skip it. Uh, uh, you know, like the food waste was like one third of our waste. It's like, okay, geez, this is a lot of food and which is also money that we throw into the trash. So everything we shop, we shop in bulk. So we just take these down to the people's co-op where we shop and refill them. We, well, pre-weigh them and then refill them. And then they just come home like this. We store everything without plastic. So like beeswax wrap is instead of saran wrap. And these actually like last longer than saran wrap. We really used the space. We grow food on the front of the house, the side of the house, and the back of the house. And we end up being able to grow about 70% of the food that our family of five eats. And we still leave a little room for the kids to play, have a trampoline and a swing set. We think it brings so much to our family. Not only does it bring us food and, and nourishment, but our kids love to play in the garden. I always talk about our gardens like a little science laboratory. Uh, the kids are learning about growing and about life and about bugs and about soil uh, and about composting. And so there's just so much to learn about. And I would just put this right into the soil. The majority of the things that you can swap out for zero waste options for your kids is also uh, less chemicals and 
that actually reduces the chemicals your kids are exposed to. So it's like a win-win situation. One of the decisions that we made is that we don't have a TV at home. What we found is, is that kids who just spend a lot of time in front of screens, it kind of steals their imagination away. So that was a conscious decision to create that space for them to really develop and nurture their imagination. And I love how creative our kids are. We play lots of games, we do things in the garden. We have our whole dining room is really an arts and crafts room. And one of the things that I learned as a parent is when your kids come to you and said, hey dad, I'm bored, the natural reaction is to try to come up with something for them to do. But the key is just to say, okay, because usually about 10 or 15 minutes after they complain that they're really bored, some of the most creative play <laughs> happens. That's when they find something really fascinating and really interesting to do, doing something uh, that they hadn't really done before. Good job, Noah. Whenever anybody says that they really want to uh, go zero waste or start living more sustainably, I always say, take one step at a time. Don't try to change everything at once. Um, find something, find a change that you can make in your daily life today and make that change and then make another one and then make another one. On August 12th, 1995, 25 years ago this month, Paul Vaden beat Vincent Petway at the MGM Grand Garden Arena in Las Vegas. When referee Richard Steele stopped the fight with 27 seconds left in the 12th round, Vaden became the IBF Junior Middleweight World Champion, the only native San Diegan to win a world title. And a new champion, Paul Vaden, as he upsets Vincent Petway for the IBF Junior Middleweight Championship. I was waiting to wake up. Wake up and, and, and think this was a dream. Vaden recently visited the Jackie Robinson YMCA, the place where, as an eight-year-old, his boxing career truly began. This created the, the outlet, the path for me. This became the place that I would go um, for so much um, to become a better boxer. But at the same time, because the people who were there teaching me to be a better being, a better human being. Since his childhood, a new facility has been built on the site that sparked imagination and sharpened his skills. So this is where the boxing ring was. Um, in, the, in this back part right here, my eyes and my focus immediately went to this boxing ring. I've seen Muhammad Ali dance in these things. I had to convince my father. He knew I wanted to become this champion, but since four, and he knew I liked Muhammad Ali, but I like Muhammad Ali like kids, like Superman. You know, like kids, like, you know, like Batman, like that. When he said yes to it, um, he said yes to a lot of things for me. He opened up a lot of possibilities for me and I was all in. The hills behind the Y forged the physical and mental toughness to navigate 337 amateur fights and paved his path to a pro career. Robert Coons uh, like said our coach, he would have us start and he would say time or he, he'd say time, and so the first one go. And then he'd go, time. You know, then, and then you know, he'd give a little gap. And the whole thing was about not letting anyone pass you. If someone passed you, you had to do more. And also there was a motivation. You also wanted to pass people as well. It became very important to me as I got older because that became like my, you know, like a model to make sure that people didn't catch up to me. Make sure in, in order for that to happen, I had to stay motivated. Um, I had to um, be willing to uh, continue to evolve um, because I could not let someone catch me on the hill. I couldn't let someone pass me. At the same time, as I continued to grow, I wanted to keep passing up others. At a corner store where Paul grew up, his late father, Gerald, would buy Vaden's siblings candy, but young Paul waited for copies of Ring Magazine. For me, my commitment to boxing was so deep that I didn't want sweets. Um, I didn't want any of those things because I wanted to save up um, for each month for him to purchase uh, the Ring Magazine. You know, all the greats you get to read about, you get to see the rankings. Uh, and for me, I was, I was nourished um, by reading stories uh, on, on those great fighters. And, and of course, visualizing and seeing myself um, 
being there, being ranked, being a champion. Then I was in it, and then I was, you know, ranked as a champion and then you know stories being done on, on me so to have that come full circle like that i was flattered when vaden opened a fedex package six days after winning the title he couldn't wait to share it with his father after winning the world title on august 12th the first place i went was here um, to show it hoist it and, and and thank him but also let him know that the dream had been realized not just for me um, but for our family the Vaden name. I would have did anything for, for him to have been able to witness it, to at least have the opportunity. Now, a quarter century later, Vaden cherishes the life lessons boxing has taught him. Here we are, 25 years later, and I'm still growing. I mean, I'm, I'm 52 years of age, but I'm actually still on the come up. What goes around comes around. How did I treat people when I was champion? How did I treat people when I was on the path? And I think I, I, I can look in the mirror knowing that I feel really good about how I, how I have tried to treat people and continue to um, treat people like they're all stars, everyone. I want everyone else to feel this uh, experience of being a champion in, in, in the realms of the way they live. So what goes around comes around, which is bigger than the sport bigger than what I what I was achieved in, in the ring. My mom always says, you know, uh, my mom, dad and mom helping people, you know, don't look down on people unless you're helping them up. Gun violence is not new. Discrimination and violence targeting Latinos and immigrants is not new. Reflecting on the terrorism in El Paso, gun violence impacting or targeting the Latinx and immigrant communities is not new. There are people in this world that consider us inferior human beings because of what we look like and where we come from. We fit the description of the people that the shooter in El Paso targeted. I cannot escape the thought of being in imminent danger. Our families live in fear. Fear of being put in a detention center. Fear of family separation. Fear of our very own neighbors. Today, I don't feel welcome in the United States of America. Are we terrified? Perhaps, but no more than we were the day before. This is our America. I long for the day in which this reality comes to an end. When our administration portrays Muslims, Blacks, Latinx as people to fear, the white supremacists are empowered to act on their hate and terrorize our most vulnerable communities. We need to call this act of terror for what it is, an act of hate and racism. What I want each of you to know is that hate is taught and emboldened by small, petty minds. Their hatred and violence has nothing to do with you and everything to do with the absence of love in their lives. My people are strong enough to withstand any attack, for our purpose is much larger than the hostility that white nationalism has created in this nation. I rest in the faith I have in my community because we are resilient people. Our words carry power to heal and to unite. Keep loving yourselves for who you are, Americans with Latinx hearts and souls. Never shy away from who you are. For every white supremacist, there are hundreds of us acting with love. Love will win.